Turn with me to the book of Genesis, to the book of, to the 37th chapter. In verse 1, Jacob lived in the land of his father's sojournings in the land of Canaan. These are the generations, the Tuldot of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was pastoring the flock with his brothers. He was a boy with the sons of Bilhah and Zilpah, his father's wives. And Joseph brought a bad report to them, to their father, of them to their father. Now Israel loved Joseph more than any other of his sons because he was the son of his old age. And he made him a robe of many colors. But when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him and could not speak peaceably, peaceably, peacefully to him. Now Joseph had a dream. And when he told it to his brothers, they hated him even more. He said to them, here's this dream that I have dreamed. Behold, we were binding sheaves in the field. And behold, my sheaf arose and stood upright. And behold, your sheaves gathered around it and bowed down to my sheaf. His brothers said to him, are you indeed to reign over us? Or are you indeed to rule over us? So they hated him even more for his dreams and for his words. Then he dreamed another dream and told it to his brothers and said, Behold, I have dreamed another dream. Behold, the sun and the moon and eleven stars were bowing down to me. But when he told it to his father and to his brothers, his father rebuked him and said to him, What is this dream that you have dreamed? Shall I and your mother and your brothers indeed come to bow ourselves to the ground before you. And his brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept the saying in mind. We want to tonight begin the final narrative of the book of Genesis, which concerns the person of Joseph. But let us close out our, our meditations on the life of Jacob that leads up to the introduction to Jacob's son, Joseph, which the rest of Genesis is concerned with for a reason, and we'll talk about that in a minute. When we left Jacob last week, he had encountered a man while confronting his having to face his brother Esau, whom 20 years before he had left Canaan, fleeing for his life, having understood that Esau was intending to kill him. Jacob had two obstacles in his life which he had to overcome. The first was Laban and his having been mistreated by him for 20 years. And if you weren't here last week, we talked about God's sovereign plan to uh, bring brokenness into Jacob's life by uh, chastising him and, and essentially causing him to have to submit to a man who is better at scheming and lying and cheating than Jacob ever was. But this is all the hand of a loving God to transform Jacob. Jacob successfully deals with Laban, leaving Padam Aram with his flocks, his family, his 12 sons, their uh, great wealth, and they return uh, and come back to the land of Canaan. And now Jacob must deal with his second fear, dealing with Esau and the threat of Esau to take his life. We have seen in the previous lectures that Jacob is a man who has contended with man all his life. And that is what Jacob means, as we've seen. Jacob means schemer, deceiver, cheater. And that is, Jacob is aptly named. But what we learn tonight in the end of his life is the mask is pulled away and we see that Jacob has actually been contending not with man all his life, but with God. It is with God that he must deal. And Jacob's life, especially that of Joseph, which I'll introduce tonight, Lord willing, will teach us much about the precious truth of God's providence. I hope that you're a student in your life of the providence of God. That God is supernatural and superintending your affairs. And Jacob now will, will, end, uh, will learn that God has hemmed his way. He must learn ultimately to deal with God when it comes to the circumstances of life. Providence is pastoral. It's not just a concept that God leads me and directs me, 
but it is pastoral in that it teaches us not to deal with second and third causes primarily, but to deal with the loving hand of a father who loves us so much and is committed to our being conformed to the image of the Lord Jesus. That's the life of Jacob. And even to the end, we see Jacob manipulating, uh, dividing up his children and his flocks until finally he is left alone. And we are told that a man wrestled with him until daybreak. For the first time, Jacob is alone. And the text emphasizes that, but he's not alone. Now he's contending with the man he's really been contending with all his life. And he's so strong that he wrestles with him uh, all night. And the man sees that he has not prevailed. And he says, let me go, uh, for the dawn is breaking. But Jacob, even to the end, is insistent and says, I will not let you go unless you bless me. And how does the man, capital M, bless Jacob? By dislocating the socket of his thigh. And you remember the man's question, what is your name? How many of you believe sincerely that the man who is, I believe, a Christophany, a, a pre-incarnate appearance of the Lord Jesus, how many of you believe the man had forgotten Jacob's name? And needed to, I don't think that's what's in order here. Jacob is being asked what his name is, not merely to repeat his name so the angel or the man might remember, but because the man now wants Jacob to fess up to who he really is. I am Viakov, supplanter, cheater, deceiver, liar. And it is then... And only then, when he recognizes that he is all of that, that the angel confers on him a new name. You shall be Yisrael. You have striven with God and man, and you have prevailed. To be a prince with God is to be overcome by God because you have faced your true nature. You can never be Israel until you recognize that you are Jacob. And that is not only true of this patriarch, but it is really true of the process of sanctification. Sanctification occurs when we take ownership and recognition to the fullest measure of what it means to be depraved human beings, fallen, uh, broken, uh, marred by sin from head to foot. And then Jacob says, what is your name? And the angel or the man refuses to tell Jacob what his name is. But we know who Jake, that Jacob knows who this is because at the end of the episode, he gives this area at the fort of Jabbok where he's had this encounter a name. He calls it Piniel or Piniel, which means face of God. And Jacob says, for I have seen God face to face. And we know that Jacob saw God face to face because from here on out, he walks with a limp. He's a broken man, but he's the Israel of God. In the following chapter, Jacob went on and faced his meeting with Esau. Notice the connection here. It is when Jacob contends with God and is broken by God that he is now able to deal with Esau and walk into that and face Esau, who doesn't retaliate against Jacob as Jacob had feared, but embraces him and kisses him, and then they go their separate ways. Jacob then journeys to Sukkot in chapter 33 at the end and stayed there for a while. That's the name, by the way, Sukkot, which would be later the name of an important feast in Israel, Sukkot, which festival, which Jewish feast is Sukkot? Who knows? Tabernacles. Good. There's three feasts that would become central feasts. There's seven, but three primary. Pesach, Shavuot, Pentecost, and Sukkot, which is booze. And that's the name that, David, that Jacob gave to this area. From there, he travels to Shechem, and he buys a piece of land there from the sons of Hamar, who is Shechem's son, and he builds an altar. And I want you to notice that as we come to the end of Jacob's life, it's not the full end because Jacob 
will pro figure prominently in the history of his son Joseph. But Jacob does two things that are intended in the text to help us to understand that his focus has changed. We have seen that before this man is the Israel of God, his focus is on self. His focus is on me, and, 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 uh, and he's bargaining with God and striving with man. But that his focus is changed is evident in the text by two altars that Jacob builds at two different sites, the first being uh, at Shechem. He calls the altar El Elocho Yisrael, the God, the God of Israel. And his focus now is on worshiping God. It is clear from the rest of Jacob's story that his focus has changed from self to God. It is, it is sad, though, that while Jacob is sojourning at Shechem with the sons of Hamar, that the son of Hamar, Shechem, violated Jacob's daughter Dinah. You can read this in the 34th chapter. We're not going to spend any time on it. But she was violated and raped by Hamar. And you remember that he then wants to marry her. And Jacob tells the sons of Hamar that you must be circumcised before we can enter any alliance. And so they agree to it. They're circumcised. The men are in pain after three days. And Jacob's sons, Simeon and Levi, come in anger in the night, unbeknownst to Jacob, and kill all the males and wipe out the entire tribe in a night raid. Jacob re retorts to this violent crime and says uh, in chapter 34, he says, you have brought trouble on me by making me stink to the inhabitants of the land, the Canaanites and the Perizzites. My numbers are few, and if they gather themselves against me and attack, I shall be destroyed, both I and my household. But they said, should he treat our sister like a prostitute? By the way, Reuben, uh, who, uh, 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 Simeon rather, and Levi would pay for this later, in the prophetic words that Jacob gave over his sons, they lost much in this violent display and breaking covenant with the sons of Hamar who had willingly become circumcised. It is then in chapter 35 that God appears to Jacob and once again calls him back to Bethel. How many remember we talked about it a couple of weeks ago? When Jacob left Canaan to go back to Haran, to escape Esau's wrath. It was when he was lying with a stone under his head and the heavens in a dream open up and a ladder appears with angels ascending and descending that Jacob had named that place Bethel. And there he had built an altar. And now God says, go back. And you remember, Jacob had made an important vow at Bethel that if the Lord would keep him, and if the Lord would bless him, and everything, check it out, every single thing that Jacob had asked in vow to God, God has now given Jacob. And in returning to the land, he is now to worship the God who kept his end of the bargain. We know that a fundamental shift has occurred in Jacob because as he's coming back to the land, he now tells his wives and household, to put away their foreign gods and make the Lord their only God. You have to understand that Jacob is a clan by now with his sons and their wives. This is not just Jacob and a few people. And so uh, many of his wives and his household servants had other gods. But it is significant that with all this change in the revelation of God which came, Jacob now uh, is uh, instructing his family that we will worship only the Lord our God alone. And so Jacob comes back to Bethel, and a significant thing happens. He comes back and builds an altar there. Previously, this place was called Bethel, but now he names it El Bethel, a significant shift and change from his initial Bethel experience where he was so focused on self. He no longer calls it the house of God, but the God of the house of God, which again signifies that a fundamental shift has occurred 
in Jacob's thinking. He is no longer a self-centered man, but he's now, the, he renews the vows uh, that he had made at Bethel, and now it is the God of the house of God that is his primary focus. You know, that speaks to me of volumes, because so often people come into a church setting where God dwells in the local church, and they have an experience with God, and they're caught up. This was my experience. They're caught up in the house of God and all the activity and the things that they experience early on in the house of God. And it can be years later, and this is so true of ministry because so many leaders are focused on Bethel, building the house. But in brokenness, Je Jacob is now a man who has come back to his center. How many have discovered in your life, in the life of sanctification, God is working deeply in all of us so that our focus, our center, our reference point is God, not man, not what we're experiencing, not even blessing as wonderful as they are, but the focus is on God. And so when Jacob renames the, Be the altar Beth El Bethel, it signifies this significant change from his initial Bethel experience. Then he journeys on from there to Ephrata, which is in the vicinity of Bethlehem, when Rachel, his dearly beloved, who's fairly old by now, goes into labor to birth, give birth to their final son, Rachel's final son. And as she's dying in labor, this is found in, his, in Genesis 35 as well, she calls him a specific name. She calls him Benoni, which means son of my suffering because the life is, is, uh, is oozing out of her as Benjamin is being born. And so she calls him Benoni. But Jacob quickly, this is found in Genesis 35 in verse 16, Jacob corrects her. And as her soul was departing, she called him Benoni, but his father called him Benjamin which is very interesting because Benoni means son of my suffering and Benjamin means son of my right hand. Jacob corrects it. And this second son of Rachel, the brother of Joseph, Benjamin, will figure prominently in the Joseph narrative. But how many see in Benjamin something that I want to talk about in a moment about the life of Joseph? How many... Uh, see in Benjamin a definite type of someone who is given two names. He is the son of my suffering and the son of my right hand. Who would that, pray tell, be? None other than the Lord Jesus, the son of God's suffering, the son of his right hand. I love these pictures, and we will talk about types in a minute. I don't want to do it here. But what a lovely picture of our Lord Jesus, who is the Benoni Benjamin, the son of my suffering, the son of my right hand. And Jacob now comes at the end of chapter 25 back to his father at Hebron. At the end of chapter 35, his father Isaac is still alive. In fact, Isaac would live till he's 180 years old. I think he lived 10 years into the Joseph experience of Joseph's departure into Egypt. So Isaac lives longer than any of the patriarchs, 180 years old. And then in Genesis 36, we have an account of the generations of Esau who are enumerated for us because Esau and Edom would play such a significant part of the life of Israel. But then the narrative suddenly shifts to the final narrative or the final story of a character in Genesis. And surprisingly, it, it focuses on Joseph. If you look at Genesis 32, which we read earlier, we have in verse 2, these are the Taldot of Jacob. And the entire focus of the narrative now is on Joseph, one of the 12 sons of Jacob. Now the question I want to ask is why? Why does the rest of Genesis, 13 chapters, focus primarily on Joseph, the son of Rachel. Well, always remember 
historically, the historical redemptive flow of Scripture, Moses is writing Genesis at a time when uh, he is leading Israel out of Egypt. And Israel, we remember, would have questions. One of them we've already seen answered in the Jacob narrative, and that is, how did we become one nation with 12 tribes? What's that about? And so the text carefully records how Jacob, in the busiest season in his life, was having all this offspring, not only with his wives Leah and Rachel, but with his two handmaidens, Bilhah and Zilpah. And this is how Jacob became 12 and how we became a nation of 12 tribes. But then Israel would have another question, and I say have a question, they these things were rehearsed in their ears, but this book was written to answer these questions. If God gave us the land of Canaan for our dwelling, how is it that we got to Egypt? Why did there have to be an exodus? If God gave us a land of promise and promised it to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, how in the world did we end up in Egypt and why was that necessary? So remember, this is the context in which Moses is writing, because Moses, who wrote the Torah, is writing during the period in which he is leading Israel out of Egypt, presumably. And Joseph's story now is the necessary link between Genesis and Exodus. You can't understand Exodus when you open it up if you don't read the Joseph narrative, because it is the link between the two books, and it gives reason one for the other. But there are also, and I want to prepare you for this as we go through this narrative up front, so when we go through the Joseph narrative over the next week, uh, you will have some theological perspective. Because there are two things, two theological matters and textual matters that we will have to glean from the Joseph story. The first, and it's not the first time, I just did one, but Joseph's life is so full of this that we have to stop and take notice of these two theological matters. First, Joseph's life teaches us how important biblical typology is. Now, how many of you are familiar with biblical typology? How many know what a typology is? Or how many know what a type is? Uh, you know, in a way, to, the simplest way to describe it, it's a sort of symbolism. When we say that someone or something is a type, we are saying that a person in the Old Testament behaves in a way that corresponds to Jesus and his actions and character in the New Testament. So the person is actually living this history, but uh, they're behaving in a way that sheds light on someone else in the New Testament. And the Old Testament is full of these types. The book that really highlights this more than any in the New Testament is the book of Hebrews, which, uh, for example, the tabernacle in the wilderness, getting ahead of ourselves, we'll come to that in a few weeks. That whole system of worship was a type of the Lord Jesus Christ and the whole realm of redemption. So types are very important. Now, actually, what I find surprising is the New Testament never calls Joseph a type. And the New Testament talks about types, but Joseph is never talked about as a type. But most Bible teachers and scholars agree that when it comes to a type of Christ in the Old Testament, Joseph is right up at the front. And they're very similar. I, I, I noted, as we go into the Joseph narrative, I noted some of the typology of Joseph's life and how he corresponds to Christ. Listen to this. I've noted just about 15 or so. There's probably more. Both were firstborns. Both were most loved by their fathers. Both were prophesied to be rulers. Both had brothers that did not believe in him, in them, and were jealous of them. Both were killed, although Joseph only figuratively. Joseph was also presumably killed and raised from the dead. Joseph was sold as a slave into Egypt, 
while Jesus was betrayed for the price of a slave, both were falsely accused. Both were with two others condemned to die while one was pardoned. Both, uh, the, uh, one was, the, uh, one the king of Egypt exalted as ruler over Egypt while the God of heaven exalted Jesus above the universe. You get the idea. Joseph lived all this, but in living it, he sheds light on the reality of another person. And, and in fact, the Bible is so full of these typologies, and you will find, even in people like Moses, Joseph obviously, Moses and others, we have types of the wonderful Lord Jesus. There's another theological truth that we will glean from Joseph's life. I've just mentioned it, but let me spend a little more time on it because it's so critical. Joseph's life is a, uh, a, 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 a biblical re revelation of God's providence. There probably is no person in Scripture whose life exemplifies the importance of the doctrine of providence as much as Joseph. His life clearly teaches what we must learn if we're going to understand the work of God in our lives. Now, let's be clear on what providence is. You've heard that term. It's not actually a biblical term, but it's like the, the word trinity. We don't find that word in Scripture, but I believe that word is a word that is legitimate in describing a biblical truth, a biblical reality that God is three in one. The same with providence. The word may not be found. The concept is clearly taught in Scripture. And it has reference, uh, here's a technical definition, it has reference to that preservation, care, and government of God which He exercises over all the things He has created in order that they may accomplish the ends for which they were created. Let me read that again. It has reference to that preservation, care, and government of God, which He exercises over all things He has created, in order that they may accomplish the ends for which they were created. Maybe the better way of understanding this word providence is to understand the words that form, the two words from which providence is derived. They are two Latin words. One is pro, which means, what is pro? If you put P-R-O at the beginning of a word, what does that mean? Ahead. Yes, te technically ahead. And the second word is vidir, V-I-D-E-R-E, which means to see. So the word providence simply means to see ahead. And it simply refers to foresight or seeing ahead. Now, how many of you are confident that God's never surprised. Things don't happen and He doesn't go, I didn't expect that. For various reasons, one of which not because He sees the future and knows what we're going to do before, but because He's working all things out according to the counsel of His will. And the story of Joseph demonstrates how God wonderfully sees ahead and works out his purpose even though parties are violating his will and sinning and doing their own thing, but God's purpose, seeing ahead, is working as well. And so this doctrine of providence is so important. And it's not important simply to earn, learn intellectually. It's important that you and I be uh, aware of providence working in our lives. How many of you have gone through difficulties at which at the time you were convinced God has left you? He has taken a vacation. I've just gone through two years and he has checked out only to look back and see the thread of God's hand working in your life. And you not only endured that time, but that time was superintended in God's providence by a loving God who cared for you. And that very time became very precious to you because you saw the providential hand of God moving. Now, what I want you to see is the parties involved in this story 
are not mere puppets being dangled against their wills. You know, we don't have in brothers really kindly, good-hearted men who are forced by God now to become hateful of Joseph and despiteful. No, they are working in their own sinful choices, but God's providence is greater than sinful choices. What's the ultimate example of that? The Lord Jesus, His death. Wicked men took him, rejected him, crucified him. His passion was a crime. But Peter stands up on the day of Pentecost and says, God, and I'm paraphrasing, according to his foreknowledge and predetermined plan, you took him and by wicked hands you crucified him. So providence is a wonderful thing. And Joseph's story will teach us something else, that it falls within the purview of providence. It is something that is vital that we learn, and it really reflects on the tech class, that if we're going to be faithful, mature believers, you will not escape what I'm about to say. God uses tribulations, difficulties, and problems which He allows and causes to uh, occur to us because they cause us to grow. How many have discovered, try as you may, you have them. Your life is full of them. Romans 5, James 1, some of the texts that we talked about in the class Sunday, uh, 1 Peter 1, all tell us that God allows these difficulties in His providential hand. Joseph will know it full well at the end of his life. In fact, Psalm 105, verses 17 on, really describe the whole life of Joseph. Remember that text. I'll read it to you. It says, He sent a man before them, Joseph, who was sold as a slave. They afflicted his feet with fetters. He himself was laid in irons until the time that his word came to pass. The word of the Lord tested him. That's one of the interesting things about prophets. They prophesy, but they're not exempt from the very circumstances. You know, like if they prophesy famine, how many know the prophets went through it too? They weren't exempt. And I love this phrase, the word of the Lord tested him. Now Joseph, let's just take an introduction to Joseph. I have 10 minutes. Joseph was with the sons of Bilhah and Zilpah. In verse 2 of Genesis 37, he's 17 years old. The family is uh, uh, living in Hebron with Isaac. And Joseph is 17-year-old, pastoring the flock with his brothers. But he's with the brothers of the two uh, servants of Jacob, Bilhah and Zilpah, and there is right off the bat some bad blood. Already there's a problem in that Jacob is repeating the sins of his father Isaac. Remember the favoritism which gave birth to all the rivalry between the wives and trying to please Jacob. And already we, we see a problem in that Jacob loves the, uh, his son Joseph more than all of his other sons because he was the son of his old age. And uh, if you've ever known men who've had children young on and then later in life unexpectedly had sons, you will know that this is often a reality. Uh, so endeared was Jacob to his son Joseph that he made him what Scripture calls a coat of many colors, uh, which if you have a good Bible, may say a robe with long sleeves. And it indicated firstborn rights. And so Jacob, unbeknownst or in, in uh, disagreement with what he already knows about firstborn, is conferring that right on Joseph and his brothers are angry about it. And they're so angry at him that it says they can't even speak peacefully to him anymore when is they, they discerned his father's love for him above them and that his father favored him with firstborn privileges. And then prophetic dreams occur. Now this is fascinating that Joseph has these dreams and he himself doesn't know it. But there's every, and we can't prove this, but I see without, and most scholars agree, that Joseph is 
a little precocious here. He gets what the dreams are inferring. And this 17-year-old kid, favored by his dad, prouncing around in his many-colored coat, signifying he's the firstborn, the favorite of his father. And now he comes and boasts in his brother's ears, I've had a dream. In this dream, we were binding sheaves in the field, and behold, my sheaf arose and stood upright. And behold, your sheaves gather around it and bow down to my sheaf. And his brothers immediately understood the implications of these dreams. Are you indeed to reign over us? Or are you indeed to rule over us? How many think it was wise for Jacob to share these dreams with his brothers? I think he was rubbing it in, rubbing it in a little more. Not only am I favorite of dad, but you're going to bow down to me. I'm going to reign over you. And so they hated him, it says, even more for his dream. And on top of it, and for his words. I think he went beyond relaying the dream and it was sort of that, na 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 Dad loves me more than you. But of course, what's happening here is Joseph is being given prophetic insight. I was reflecting on this in my own history with the prophetic. Because how many have learned that when you receive the prophetic word, and I've had several at key points in my sojourn that have turned out to be so wonderfully true. But how many know at the time, you try to figure out how this is going to happen. You make two mistakes. Number one, you think, this is going to happen Wednesday, when it may take 20 years. Because I was reflecting on some of the prophetic words that have marked out my sojourn over the last 40 years. And some of them were 25, 30 years in the fulfillment. But you always think it's going to happen Wednesday. I got it Monday. By Wednesday night, I'll be walking in this. And number two mistake with the prophetic is you always have no clue what it's going to take. How many know, as, as Bob Mumford used to say, you never read the fine print of the contract. You know, someone prophesies to you, you will be an apostle, and you see capital A, and you say, yes, I'm going to be an apostle. But you don't bother to read the four paragraphs of fine print. You will be an apostle after you're ejected from seven churches, uh, misunderstood, maligned, mistreated, mocked, then you might begin to, you know, nobody reads that. Nobody wants to read the fine print, as Brother Mumford used to say. But this is the case with Jacob, with Joseph. He has no clue when this will happen, what it will be, although he understands the inference. Then he dreams another dream, beginning in verse 9 of 37. Behold, I have dreamed another dream. He tells his brothers again. Behold, the sun, the moon, and eleven stars were bowing down to me. But when he told it to his father and his brothers, his father rebuked him and said to him, What is this dream that you have dreamed? Shall I and your mother and your brothers indeed come to bow ourselves to the ground before you? And his brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept the saying in mind. So his father now understands the implications of these dreams. He rebukes him, but his father is listening to it. So the story of Joseph starts with this prophetic history. Joseph is seeing by God's hand in dreams that he is destined to be the deliverer. By the way, what moment in Jacob's life is he seeing? Joseph's life, excuse me, when he, is he seeing when he talks about the sheaves bowing down to him and the sun and the moon and the stars bowing down? What is he seeing? This will come to pass literally years later when Jacob and his sons come and bow before Joseph, unbeknownst to them, it's Joseph who is now the ruler of Egypt. And this is how Joseph's prophetic history starts. So afterwards, as we close this up, his brothers went to Shechem with their father's flock, and his father sends Joseph to inquire of them. And Joseph finds his brothers at Dothan. And it's then as they see Joseph approaching, his brothers mock him and say, here comes this dreamer, let us kill him. And they would have killed him, they plotted to kill him, if it wasn't for Reuben, the firstborn, who delivered and rescued him from their hands. Reuben instead convinces them to strip him of his coat and throw him into a cistern or pit. 
So heartless are these brothers that they throw him in the pit, which was a man couldn't live in a pit for very long, and then they sit down and have their afternoon meal and converse, what will they do with Joseph? And it's while they're sitting, eating together, that they lift up her eyes, and on the horizon is a company of Ishmaelites traveling down to Egypt. And Judah convinces uh, them to, instead of killing him, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites and feign that he's been killed by a wild beast. Judah, by the way, or Reuben, by the way, is gone at this time. Judah uh, suggests this. The brothers agree. They pull him out of the pit, and they sell Joseph to Ishmaelites as a slave for 20 pieces of silver. Meanwhile, Reuben comes back, and when he discovers what they've done and that jo Joseph is not in the pit, they slaughter a goat. Think about how heartless. They've lied. They've sold their brother. They slaughter a goat. They dip Joseph's tunic in the goat's blood. Take it back to Jacob with a lie that his son was devoured by a wild beast. Now, is Romans 8.28 at this point true for Joseph? All things work together. Is this God's hand? We would be tempted to say, no, God has abandoned Joseph. But the doctrine of providence would school us in recognizing that even though evil men plotted his demise, the God of heaven is still working out his purpose and has a plan, and it's right on schedule. I, I don't know about you. It's easy to trace God's hand in the evident blessing. But Joseph is in the middle of God's will, and he doesn't know it. And these brothers are still guilty for their own sin. That's the amazing thing about providence. They're acting in their, uh, according to their own kind or their own heart uh, characters, but God is working out a great purpose. And we will see as the Joseph story unfolds in the next week and two that God has gone ahead of Israel to prepare a place for them in a very severe famine. And I think the best way to close up this session is to remember again this wonderful psalm, which I think really sums it up well. He sent, he sent a man before them. Joseph, God sent, not the devil. God sent a man, Joseph, who was sold as a slave. They afflicted his feet with fetters. He was laid in irons until the time that his word came to pass, the word of the Lord tested him. And Joseph would now enter a severe trial. And what's amazing about it is in the worst conditions he's in, the text will repeat it again and again, and the Lord was with Joseph. And the Lord blessed Joseph, which is an indication that this man is right where God wants him to be for a purpose. And one of the things we see in the story is God's purpose is bigger than an individual. He works out a kingdom purpose, and we need to be schooled in seeing the events of our lives in the purpose of God for the kingdom. Amen and amen. Please be uh, reading the rest of Genesis this week. If everybody could read through 37 to 50. And I would encourage you to read it more than once if you can. It's the wonderful story of Joseph. And we're going to take that up completely in our next hour next week.